Good afternoon. My name is Colleen Horonchek, and I am a policy analyst with the Cato Institute's Center for Educational Freedom. And I'm really happy to be moderate, moderating a discussion today between two esteemed scholars. And I don't just say that because one of them is my boss. I'm joined today by Jonathan Zimmerman, who is a professor of history of education at the University of Pennsylvania and author of the recently released book, Who's America? Culture Wars in the Public Schools. And Neil McCluskey, who's director of the Center for Educational Freedom here at Cato and author of another recently, reduced, recently released book, Fractured Schoolhouse, Reexamining Education for a Free, Equal and Harmonious Society. We're glad you're joining us and please be sure to send us any of your questions. You could do it right on the website or Facebook or YouTube, wherever you're watching it and on uh, Twitter using the hashtag CatoCEF. And then you can visit Cato's event page to get additional resources associated with the webcast today. So now, pleased to welcome Jonathan Zimmerman. Thanks, Colleen, and uh, thanks to Neil for organizing this panel and congrats to him on his book. Um, Colleen just showed you the 2022 edition of my book, but she didn't show you the 2002 edition. Um, the new edition is a 20th anniversary edition, and I think the best way I can explain the difference and what I think has changed is just by briefly describing the way I described the landscape in 2002 and what I think has changed since then. So when I wrote the first edition of this book, there's the first edition uh, in 2002, I wanted to examine how Americans had argued over the school curriculum in the public schools in two broad areas, history and religion. And what I ended up arguing in 2002 was that our history wars had the wrong solution and our religion wars had no solution at all. The history wars I thought had the wrong solution because the way we quote solve them or created truces in them was by adding new figures to the story without asking how they changed the story. Um, so if anyone tells you now that textbooks are just about white men, they just haven't looked at one. That's false. Um, but for most of our history, that's precisely what they were. And people that weren't white men fought quite vehemently and ultimately successfully to have their stories included in the textbooks, which to be clear is something that I applaud. The problem, as I described in the 2002 edition, was that when we added those groups, we didn't ask the hard questions about what their edition did to the larger story. And that's why the title of the textbook remained the same, even as the textbook became 800 pages long. And the title was Rise of the American Nation or you know, Triumph of Liberty. And it was Jim Lowen, who unfortunately passed recently, who had the great line, have you ever noticed that the physics textbook is not called Rise of the Periodic Table, um, you know, Triumph of the Atom. Only the history textbook is called that. Um, uh, and uh, on the religion side, um, I decided that our religious battles really didn't have any solution because religion and religious claims often involve mutually incommensurate statements. Uh, either he was the son of man or he wasn't. Either human beings share DNA with other creatures or they don't. Um, either uh, sex out of straight marriage is a sin or it isn't. Uh, and these were all disputes that charted in the first edition, that is school prayer, um, uh, school ed Bible reading, and sex ed. And I decided at that time that those debates really didn't have any kind of solution. Uh, again, because there was no way to strike a compromise between their respective claims. So that's where I was in 2002. Um, and the reason I wrote a 20th anniversary edition, and that's this one, is I decided that, well, a whole lot had changed. Um, the religion wars radically cooled in the United States. Uh, um, they didn't go away, but they radically cooled. Um, uh, when was the last time you read about a big debate in a school district about, for example, evolution and creation? Um, uh, to be clear, those disputes do occur. They haven't gone away, but they've radically diminished, uh, as have battles over Bible reading and school prayer. 
Even sex ed, which is a subject I've also written a book about, I would argue is much less heavily contested than it was in the past. Um, I think there are several reasons for that, but on the Occam's razor principle of the simplest explanation being the best, I think the most obvious explanation is that the country became radically less religious in the 20 years that have passed between my editions. So uh, if you look at reported average uh, um, church, synagogue, mosque attendance, or even reported affiliation with a religious organization, we think it's gone down 20% in 20 years, uh, which is, I think, a shift that's so radical that we were almost too close to it to understand. Um, the other thing that happened, which I think is quite relevant to Neil's book, is um, many Orthodox believers exempted themselves from the public schools. So a lot of uh, Orthodox Christian believers started patronizing Christian academies, uh, Christian academies, and then many of them chose to homeschool, which I think is far and away the most important thing that's happened in American education that we know and think about the least. You know, there are a hundred books about charter schools for every one book about homeschooling even though it may be that there are many kids being homeschooled in America as in charter schools. Um, so I think if you, if you think about that, uh, the, the overall decline in religious affiliation, uh, Christian academies and homeschooling, it kind of makes sense that there would be less pressure on the schools around these questions, and there has been. However, the history wars flared as never before. There's the old Chinese proverb, be careful what you wish for. And in 2002, what I wished for was a real reckoning with different views of America, rather than just piling on new figures to the same story. Well, that's what we've got. We absolutely have that. And the 1619 Project is a great example. I mean, what could be a more direct challenge to the way that many Americans have learned history, which is, as per the title of the book, you know, uh, quest for Liberty. Uh, no, you look at the title of the 1619 Project and you see that it's telling a very, very different story and it's rooting our history really in slavery and Native American removal rather than in liberty. Um, uh, so when people on the right say that the 1619 Project represents a fundamental challenge to the way many Americans have thought about their history, I think they're absolutely right. I just think it's a good challenge. And let me be clear about what I mean by that. I don't think I, I, I don't agree with everything in the 1619 Project, and I'm not here to endorse it. But I think it's a good challenge insofar as what it does is it puts really, really important questions on the table about the very nature of the United States, which if you, if you have not, not noticed, we don't agree about. Americans disagree about America. Um, what hasn't happened, is we haven't had a real encounter with these different narratives in our public schools. Now here I'm generalizing across an enormous number of school districts, which is always a dangerous thing to do. And we don't actually have very good data on what's going on, but I can tell you what I think should go on. Um, if I were king and we don't have enough time this afternoon to enumerate all the reasons that will not come to pass, every high school teacher in public schools or elsewhere would give the students the 1619 Project and the state-approved textbook in history. Um, and okay, and say, all right, kids, let's start with Columbus. Like, what does 1619 say? What does the state-approved textbook say? Okay, let's go on to the American Revolution. Uh, what does 1619 say? What does the state-approved textbook say? Uh, by the way, there are some teachers who do this, and I write about them in my book. There aren't many. Um, and by and large, that hasn't happened. So our disagreements about America, they're all around the public sphere, but I would argue they haven't really yet entered our classrooms in ways that I'd like them to. Now, why would I like them to? And I think this may sort of hopefully provide a nice segue into Neil's book. Um, the reason I would like them to is that public schools represent still our dominant, although to his point, not our only, vehicle for preparing people to be Americans. Um, uh, I think it's fair to predict that they will be for a very long time. Uh, and it is in our public schools that people learn not just about America, but hopefully how to debate about America. And they're not learning that now. And we have great evidence of that every night on cable television. My wife and I will be watching and they'll say, okay, after we sell you something, we're going to have a debate about health care or January 6th or whatever it might be. 
and then you see four talking heads and they just yell at each other. Um, and Susan and I will look at each other and say, you know, that wasn't a debate. That was sequential rants. Uh, and um, that's what people are going to think politics is. Unless our public schools, which are going to be our chief vehicle for making citizens, teach them to do it in a better way. I think this moment, the moment we're in, provides a tremendous opportunity for doing that. It is the ultimate teachable moment. The fact, and it is a fact, that Americans disagree fundamentally about the history and meaning of their country. Again, that's not an opinion, that's a fact. And you can document it in many, many different ways. That represents to me an astonishing teachable moment. Um, and to be clear, there are teachers that are utilizing it in that way and harnessing it in that way. Um, and uh, I'll just, before I sign off I'll, uh, or stop talking, I'll give you one very good example. Robbie Cohen and Sonia Morrow uh, have a book out about Howard Zinn. It's not about Howard Zinn because people have written that story many times. It's about how Howard Zinn has been taught in American classrooms. And Zinn, of course, has passed on and his papers are at the Tamman Library at NYU and they got into those. And they found teachers that did the exercise I just described, the 1619 Project, but instead with Howard Zinn's People's History of the United States. Uh, so they'd give the students, this is uh, you know, pre-internet, uh, 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 pre they'd give the students a, a copy of the chapter in Zinn about Columbus and then ask the students to read it and compare it to what they see in their textbook. And what's really magical about Robbie and Sonia's book is that because they could go into Zinn's papers, they found all this correspondence between students who had undergone this exercise and Howard Zinn. And um, uh, to reply to people who think the sort of exercise I'm describing is just blanket indoctrination, you gotta read these letters because the students take on Zinn. They're like, Mr. Zinn, I just think you were wrong about World War I or about Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But they also go on and say, yet yeah, before I did this exercise, I didn't really understand what history is, which of course is competing narratives. So we can do this. This is what some of us call democratic education with a small d. I think the real question is whether we have the will to do it, whether the demos, those pesky citizens, actually want it. So I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Thanks, Jonathan. I think you teed it up very nicely for Neil because his book, of course, does get into what he thinks of as solutions to these conflicts. So, Neil, take it away. Great. Thank you. Uh, thanks, John, for joining us. Uh, I should say that your original 2002 edition of your book, Who's America, uh, was an important source of historical information for my own book, The Fractured Schoolhouse. Um, I think everybody should, uh, I don't know, read probably both to see your evolution, but you definitely want to pick up the most recent one um, because a lot of people probably don't know a lot of this history um, and it's really important to understand it. Uh, I'm also appreciate how much uh, John is game for any kind of civil discussion about diverse ideas. Uh, I should note that he's joined us before um, he as an event where we talked about handling controversial topics in education, uh, as well as one we had a few years ago, a, a whole conference on religious freedom. Uh, we had a, a panel on religious freedom in education, uh, and he was part of that. I should also note, you can actually get his remarks from that and everybody else's remarks in a Cato book called Deep Commitments, The Past, Present, and Future of Religious Liberty. And I think you can actually download each chapter individually as a PDF. So if you want to read more of what Jonathan's done with us, with Cato, uh, you can go right there. Um, of course, the fact that we, we like to have uh, Jonathan come to Cato doesn't mean we uh, agree on everything. We do have our disagreements. And I think now having read the 20th anniversary edition of John's book, and congratulations, by the way, on that, uh, perhaps the central disagreement I have is whether public schooling is actually, and, and John mentioned this a little, sort of the essential mechanism for getting Americans to, to be citizens and to tackle and hash out controversial issues. Um, he argues, of course, I won't go over all of it again, but the, I think the locus of his book is that Again, that conflict seems to be moving from religion being the predominant uh, thing that we argued about now to basic visions of our country. Uh, many people who may not follow education policy debates super closely. A lot of that is now subsumed under the term critical race theory. 
which people, I think, on all sides tend to use for a catch-all to say all sorts of things. But that's probably where you've probably seen it if you just read your newspapers, is critical race theory has sort of encapsulated, or encapsulated a lot of this debate about basically what is this country? You know, is this country, uh, are we, have, has our history been consistent or in violation of the ideals of liberty and equality, especially concerning race, but also ethnicity and a lot of other things? That is that the big debate? And I think it is. Um, and it's become bigger than religious disputes that used to dominate, as John talked about, including, you know, evolution, um, parent schools and those sorts of things. I do think religion remains a major issue, uh, though it might not be overtly stated as often. Uh, we recently I was at an event where some conservatives were talking about critical race theory and, and conflicts in public schools, and they believe that actually we may be moving away now from the critical race theory debate more toward these discussions of what they call gender ideology questions about uh, lgbtq issues and particular transgender issues uh, and i think that has a heavy religious component it may not be spoken as overtly when we see these debates as maybe the uh, religion would have been invoked in the past uh, but I think that that could end up being, and I think we see evidence of it, the big dispute, at least in the next year or two. So I'm not sure religion has is, is gone away, maybe quite as much as, as John uh, thinks it has. But I think he's right that we are now in a debate really about the essence of this country. Um, but I have a kind of a more overarching disagreement with the book. Uh, and of course, anybody can send questions or comments. So if you want to talk about this or anything else, feel free. Um, my overarching disagreement is whether the public schools, as John asserts, really at the very end of his book, so I'm kind of moving away from the central point, but whether or not the public schools are, and I'll quote them, the central institution, unquote, where it's a society we decide, quote, who are we now and what do we want to become? Um, in my own book, this would fall under a conception I have of education and democracy, the nexus of the two, I call it the system of togetherness conception or school. I have six of these. You could break them down a lot of ways. But basically, I think the idea and is, and if, John, if I'm misrepresenting, you certainly say so. But uh, the idea is kind of that public schooling takes diverse people. And I typically think of this as more actually focused on the adults than the kids, but brings us together and sort of requires that we debate and discuss differences that we have differences about how society should be run, about morals and things like that, and use it to reach compromises. Um, I'm, again, I'm not sure that John fits particularly neatly into this, at least in my own observation. People who fit cleanly into this school of thought tend to like very local control of education, kind of idealized as the sort of New England uh, town meeting model where people in a small district they actually get together, they discuss lots of issues, they debate them, they, um, they all know each other, and they end up voting what should happen. I, I don't know that John fits into that sort of love of local control that I think I'm seeing with many people who would go into this school. Uh, I, John writes about how local control may have allowed people to avoid controversial material. I actually think he's right. I'd write that in my book, uh, in part because of what he wrote. Um, and so I don't know that that you would fit right in there, but that's sort of how I see this general idea is one of the great values of public schooling is that it, it requires us to get together with people different than we are and talk about our differences and try to resolve them. Uh, I find this problematic for really three major reasons. Um, the first is that I think it's just uh, the idea that government should establish a system in which people are forced to determine whose values win or lose, uh, or maybe just get muted uh, in, in something especially as important as where their children's, so much of their minds and, and their personalities are formed. I think that's inherently at odds with a free society. And I think free society should be our goal, especially when it comes to the role of government. Uh, second, I'm a little dubious of the premise that absent public schools or a system uh, or in the presence of a system entirely based on choice, that people would fail to tackle and grapple with controversial but important issues. Uh, and I should say that Jonathan shares a concern about the pro-school choice approach that I take with conservatives like Robert Pondicio, the American Enterprise Institute, and others who are afraid 
that look, we have choice and people just sort of pull in and not engage with people who are different than they are. Uh, but, you know, uh, John talks about the 17 or the 1619 project, absolutely huge. I mean, that's, this is clearly big. Um, it, it was opposed then by something called the 1776 curriculum, but lots of people immediately delved into the content of 1619, the claims of 1619. Um, what's important for at least the discussion about the role of public schools is that this originated not in the public schooling system, it originated with the New York Times. We have lots of debates that don't start or aren't typically uh, mainly tackled in schools. They are tackled outside of schools and schools may eventually reflect that. But I think that much of this happens outside of the schools. And it's also the case that private schools have to deal with lots of these changing moray issues. Um, for instance, there have been many stories about independent private schools, which tend to be the wealthier private schools that have had diversity, equity and inclusion uh, controversies. Uh, controversies. Uh, you see worries about whether Catholic schools are sufficiently still Catholic. Mark Bauerlein at First Things writes about this a lot. So private schools aren't walled off from the rest of society. Homeschoolers aren't walled off from the rest of society. They have access to TV, radio, the internet and are often there because they know what other people are saying and they, they don't want that to be a major part of what's in their kids' schools, but it doesn't mean that they're walled off. And I think we get the impression that if everybody had choice, we would all withdraw. Uh, finally, I think that this idea that, you know, or a, a hesitance to, to put education in choice as opposed to public schooling is, it kind of misses the stakes question. When political power decides what will or will not be taught, or which policies will or will not be used. You know, a lot of our conflicts are over which bathroom people can use, which locker room. But when it's government deciding, and government is the only institution that can legally jail you, um, we the stakes become much higher. You either win or you lose. You get something imposed on you or you don't. And I think that fuels divisiveness. I mean, there's a reason politics has always been ugly. You can go all the way back to, you know, Adams and Jefferson and the things that were said about them. It's ugly because people are put into essentially warring camps and feel like they often have to do anything they can to win or they end up losing in a way that's very important and damaging to them. I think that if we have freedom, it doesn't end these debates. It doesn't make these things less important or less real to us but it lowers the stakes in education of how we deal with them. And I think that that is the way that we can have discussions that are much more reasoned um, and that are much uh, better actually for starting to create some unity or more unity in society. Um, I, you know, we may disagree, but we don't wanna have people kind of forced into the gladiatorial arena to decide who wins. Now. Importantly, again, the value of choice is not really the main point of John's book. It's kind of the main point of mine, so I have to talk about it. Um, uh, I think his book is really important because it's about the changing face of what we are fighting over and does talk about, you know, what should be our ideals in schools. Um, and as I've already attested, I mean, it's an outstanding source of information about what we've been fighting about, what we've been fighting about for over a century, uh, and takes us right up to the present day. And so that's all I've got, and I'm looking forward to question and answers. Super. Well, we do have a lot of questions coming in from the audience, but I'm going to use the moderator's privilege and ask my own first. Um, so Jonathan, based on what Neil was just saying, which probably no surprise, I agree with a lot of what he said. And he, you know, he talked about choice being a way that we can get around a lot of these battles. And I'm just curious, in many instances in your book, you talk about how you know, there were battles and then they cool off, but really when they cool off, a lot of times that's because somebody is losing. And so how, like, how do you, I suppose, answer those concerns? Because those, those people still aren't having their values taught, they just have kind of tucked tail and turned away. Well, democracy means being willing to lose. That's, it's not the only thing it means, Right. But democracy means sometimes being in the minority and to be I, I, I take Neil's points really seriously. I thought they were very well stated and I don't want to overstate mine. I don't think public schools are the only place we make citizens. Uh, that's obviously untrue, especially in the era of screens. Um, but I still think they're the most important one. 
and they're the publicly controlled one. Most of the screens are not. Um, and, you know, um, of course people will grapple and do grapple with, you know, contested questions outside of the public schools. But it's in the public schools, I think, that you learn how to grapple with them and indeed how to lose. Um, I, look, I don't think I have to remind our listeners today that, you know, uh, um, in the last national election, there were lots of people that hadn't learned how to lose. Um, and democracy sometimes requires you to do that uh, and to fight another day. Um, uh, private schools also have their battles, as Neil pointed out, but they also have a different charge and I think a different advantage. And I'll just take the example of sex education because that's something else I've written about. Um, if, if, if you go uh, to a private school and you don't like what the private school is teaching about sex and sexuality, um, uh, you can take your kid out of the school. But more to my point, I think the school would be within its rights to say to you, look, I take your point. I know this isn't your jam. And if it's not, maybe you should think about patronizing another school. A private school would be entirely within its rights to do that. Um, a public school can't do that, right? A public school can't say, look, why don't you sell your house and move to another place? Now, I know that Neil thinks this is a huge problem. I think it's actually the heart of the system because, because of what I just described. The public school is required to try to figure out as best it can something that is relatively consensual to teach about sex. And notice I said relatively because it will never be purely consensual. And by consensual, let me just be clear. I don't mean what you think. I mean something that, you know, lots and lots of people consent to. Um, and it's hard right? Especially in the era of globalization, right? When you have so many people from so many different countries who often come with very different ideas about human sex and sexuality, and it's very tied again to their faith groups. So that becomes a challenge. But my point is, I think it's an essential challenge. It's an essential challenge for us as Americans to figure out what things we can share. And that's what the public school requires us to figure out. Uh, well, I would... I would disagree somewhat with the premise in that, uh, first of all, I, I think a lot of people actually do sort of choose their public school that people tend to choose by choosing where they live. What community do they move to? There's been some really good research on how well actually people separate themselves based on how they live. You know, there was some interesting research I talk about in my book about just, you know, like where people who like wine have all managed to somehow live in like the same four or five regions and things. So I'm not sure that that the public schools have had this ability to really bring people together and, and force them to talk through this. And I think that there's probably some of this actually in your book, Jonathan, is another way we've done it or handled these situations. We have just avoided them rather than having those discussions we're like let's just drop this topic and that's problematic because then often the kids aren't dealing with it at all uh, there was good research by berkman and plutzer who at penn state i should remember their first names but i i never do um but uh and they had done research on well what do uh biology teachers high school biology teachers teach about evolution uh, and, and creation. And there were some who taught very strict evolution, some who even taught strict creation, but many of them just, we're going to sidestep most of this because we don't want to be part of these battles. And so I, I'm not sure they, they do, the public schools do typically what we'd like them to do, but more fundamentally, it, it bothers me as a libertarian. And I would hope it bothers a lot of people. The idea that we should subject the raising of children, the forming of children to a system, to a democracy that inherently has winners and losers. I think that the one of the, well, obviously we're going to big debate everyone's having, but one of the, the central things about this country was supposed to be about protecting liberty. We do it be, with democracy because democracy is the system that we think is most consistent with liberty. But that doesn't mean that everything should be decided by a democratic process. So that's sort of my thought on those things. The last thing I'd say is as a libertarian, this was the real major libertarian point, um, 
John said, well, we learn how to lose in public schools. I can tell you, I learned a lot about losing being libertarian because we never, ever get our way. Uh, and that was, you know, that was outside of public school. I shouldn't say that. School choice has been doing pretty well, but we're used to not winning. Very true. Okay. So I'm going to shift over to the audience questions now. Some of them came in before you guys started. So I think that they've been answered in your opening remarks. Um, I'm going to go to this one from Anonymous. Neil, how might choice vision of education account for the disparity that might arise in what or whose history is taught in a nation with such massive differences in culture, race, economic status, et cetera? Well, so I think what choice enables us to do is we still have these debates about what people should learn. It's not that having choice means we're not as a nation having discussions about what should be taught. But what it doesn't do is set up this zero sum game where often if you want something taught, if you think something is right, you have to defeat your neighbors to get what you want because they want something else. I think what choice does is enables people to learn a whole lot more, a lot more rigorously about things, about questions, because they may say, this is what we believe. Here's what other believe, but this is what we believe. And you have voluntarily chosen to learn that. I totally, you know, if it were up to me, I would go with John's vision of a great history course, which is you learn the different points of view and you debate them. For one thing, there's no reason that can't happen in a private school. A private school could easily take this up. There's research that suggests actually kids who leave private schools controlling for things like socioeconomic status have more of those kind of qualities we say we want good citizens. They are they volunteer more, they're more tolerant of other views. And I think it may be because they don't fear really digging into uh, a lot of, of these uh, debates. And so I think it's really important that we have a system where people can feel the freedom to choose what they want. And that can include classes where people really grapple with these differences. And I think one of the reasons we may not see that is one, again, because teachers are often afraid that they don't want to make somebody mad. In a private school, you, you don't worry about that as much because say, if you really don't like this, you can go somewhere else. Um, and so I think that, you know, that is one important thing is you can have these debates. You don't have to be scared about having them. And that's and basically because you reduce the stakes. And then the last thing, because I forgot it, now I just remembered, there's also, I think, a fundamental problem of trust. And so I'm not sure that people, if they, you know, they're in a, especially a big district, you may have a teacher who really wants to teach these differences. And in an equal balance way, if you are just assigned to that school, will you trust as a parent that that is happening, even if the teacher means to do it? Or will you say, I'm just, not, you know, somebody just said Howard's in, and I just don't trust that they won't take Zinn's side. I mean, look, I take these points. I would just say that, you know, I think that one of, uh, in your example about the private school doing the Zimmerman exercise, Neil, someone's going to lose there too. I mean, somebody's going to lose in that debate. A, a debate, by definition, I think, involves a certain kind of loss. Somebody will have a stronger argument and somebody will have a weaker one. Um, uh, I take your point that this can happen in any number of environments, including in good private schools. But I also think that we can imagine, it shouldn't be hard, some of the real scary elements, I'm just going to use the least loaded term I can, of the vision you're articulating. Um, so, you know, I live in the city of Philadelphia where Protestants killed a whole bunch of Catholics over the question of schools. Um, there's still a lot of violence in my city, unfortunately. It does not involve Protestants and Catholics killing each other. Okay, not on those bases. Um, why is that? There are a whole bunch of reasons for it. But I would say one of them is that, yes, the state compelled those people to go to school. And even though, obviously, there were parochial school options, eventually most Catholics, although not all, and it varied from city to city, Boston was different from Chicago and so on, attended public schools, um, especially once we get into the 20th century and the Great Depression for economic reasons. Let's take the issue of race and segregation. You know, I, I really admire uh, your book, Neil, but there's one part as a historian that I very strongly disagree with, which is the discussion of segregation and desegregation. Um, because 
What I think you don't address there, and I think the social science literature is overwhelming on it, is the enormous benefits for both black and white children that occurred because of, yes, state compulsion around integration. Um, uh, I think the social science record is, is enormous on this. Um, obviously, African-Americans don't agree amongst themselves on the subject, but a vast majority of people that were bust um, believe it benefited them. Not only that, there's strong social science uh, um, uh, research showing that they're right, benefited them in terms of all these like great life outcomes. Also, huge benefits for white kids who are exposed to black kids. Now, at one point in your book, you say, well, that's not politically viable. Well, you know what? It was. The reason it's not politically viable is our politics changed, which suggests they can change again, right? The courts backed off and uh, uh, backed off on the question of integration. Um, uh, and what that means is I think they can go back on it at some point if the public wants it. Um, and it's up to people like me to remind the public how many benefits attach to what you can justly call an act of state coercion. Yes, yeah, states coerce. You want a really good example of that? Look at the grainy black and white photos of uh, Central High School in Little Rock in 1957. You'll see state coercion in very broad strokes. It's called the 101st Airborne. And I'm proud of that coercion. Well, I'll just answer that because this is really a crucial issue. Uh, well, the first thing we'd have to note is that was after the state coerced segregation. The state Correct. in many cases forced segregation. Correct. So it strikes me change. that's a bit, of a, a bit of a reach to say, well, okay, choice is dangerous because this seemed to work well. And then the point I was trying to make in my book was actually, you know, I don't disagree that, that people who experienced integrated schools in many cases had benefits from that. But what I was trying to communicate was it busing in particular, but other sorts of sort of coerced togetherness did not have enough support to remain. Now, part of that is because we had elections that ultimately led to the, to the installation of judges who ended busing orders, but we had major white flight. White flight, I note, is not actually, wasn't mainly driven by busing. It was driven by the fact that people sort of naturally tend to like to live with people like themselves. But busing itself ended up very unpopular because people don't like the coercion aspect. So it's not that there weren't benefits for people who remained. It's what it strikes me is that sort of coercion is very hard to sustain support because people don't like being forced into things. I'd like to find a way. And I think that maybe a compromise for people are things like magnet schools. The idea behind magnet schools was, look, people don't like busing. They do like the idea of being able to choose something we want. If we give something that people from different races will want to choose, that'll bring them together. And I think that's really important. If we want to have the support for integration, which I want, it, it strikes me as not sufficiently deep thinking to say, well, we could just require people to go to school together and that will lead them to combine. Even if there are benefits to going to those schools, which I think there are. So I wasn't trying to say that they're not, but if we want to have that sustainable, I think we need to think about having a system where it can't just be, you must go to school with someone different from yourself. That gives people that. something. That I agree with that. Right. I agree with that. And I think I, I may have overstated my own case. I mean, but let's also remember, Neil, that, you know, in the parents involved case, you know, in the John Roberts decision, I mean, the, this current court, it was still the Roberts court. I mean, it radically restricted what, districts can do around things like magnet options. Uh, That's so, true. It's also worth noting, yeah. though, that that case was started by an African-American who wanted to go to a particular school and couldn't because of the balancing requirements Correct. previously. Yep. So, it, I mean, at the very least, it's pretty messy. Um, yeah, and That's for sure. Not a, it's not a clear situation to me, and this is what I'm trying to emphasize in my book, is it's not, it's not as simple as if we require people to go together, they will remain together or that they'll mm -hmm. often even go. I mean, that's because we had massive resistance. We had 15 years or so really between Brown and when you started to have a concerted effort. And Swan. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and interestingly, a lot of it's the residential assignment that caused some of those schools to be segregated as well. So, you know, 
if you had a system of widespread choice, then that would be less of an issue in and of itself. But mm -hmm. veered, I veered off the moderator there. Sorry. Um, going back to the questions, we've got it's a couple really of questions. We have two Cato people and only one non Cato. But <laughs> I know, I know. I talk, talk about structural inequity. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So we've got a couple of different questions on critical thinking, and it's funny because they take opposite approach. One says, this is Maya. She says, most students in public schools learn how to conform rather than think independently. This is based on my experience with three children attending public schools in New York City and Nassau County. How do we encourage independent thinking by students in public schools? And then on the flip side, we've got Anonymous saying, how can private religious schools teach critical thinking skills? Being able to separate fact from fiction, what constitutes evidence? Doesn't religious indoctrination make thinking critical thinking, teaching critical thinking skills impossible? Oh boy. Wow, this is fantastic. Look, you know, I, I mean, I want to be really clear on the first question that what I was articulating earlier is an ideal that is often observed in the breach. I'm not here to tell you that public schools do an, ex, an exquisite job of teaching critical thinking skills. In fact, Emily Robertson and I wrote a book on the teaching of controversial issues, and it's only 100 pages long. It's like one of those great short book series, you know, and the reason is, is there's been so little of it, you know, and we try to make the case, if I may, the democratic case for why there should be more of it. Um, and, you know, a lot of the problem has to do with the authority of teachers, which in this country is very small. Teachers don't have a lot of cultural authority in this country. Um, and, you know, a lot of it has to do with the fact that, you know, to Neil's point, we're afraid. We're afraid of controversy. Um, but, you know, I think it's the public school's job to try to, to try to help us get over those fears. On the private school question, I'll, I'll yield to Neil, but I would really like him to know if a bunch of parents who believe that the earth was created in six days and then God rested should be able to use tax dollars to create a school on that premise. What? Did we say we're taking questions from the audience and John Zimmerman? <laughs> right, well, Sorry. I'll answer it. Let's see. I got to remember to write that down. Uh, the first thing I'll say is just for public schools. Um, I haven't been under the impression that public schools force people into conformity. I mean, the stereotype, at least, is, you know, you got your jocks and, and your, your nerds, and then you've got the people who are goth and all these other people. So I don't. I can't say that I've seen evidence that they force uh, conformity um, for religion. Um, so you can go to a school that teaches religion. And I think that you'd find that many people, including many people who are very religious, including people who have been you know, canonized as saints, have had many doubts about religion. It's something that I think that very few people throughout their lives just, you know, accept whatever they are told. And that is it. I think we sell people short if we think that they can't think critically about a religion that they're told, look, this is the correct religion. I, I think that people certainly question things like that. And we've seen it in so many people who are you know, thought of as great religious figures. Um, and then, yes, I would say that people should be able to have tax dollars follow their kids to uh, a creation at school, because I think that we're best off when there's a society that actually treats everybody equally. I don't know that we should, anybody should say creationism is right. If you disagree with it, say it's wrong. You're welcome to say that there's something terrible about a school that does it. But I worry a great deal when we say government gets to put their finger on the, their thumb on the scale of what is right and what is wrong, in large part because we've seen government for much of the history of public schooling Put the thumb on things that I thought and many other many other people thought was wrong. And that includes things like segregation based on race. Um, I think if, you know, you can go to the Scopes Monkey Trial, obviously we had a big debate about this, but teaching that evolution was wrong and creationism was right, it's very dangerous, I think, when we give government, which again is the only entity that can legally jail us or even legally execute us, when we give them the authority to say, well, here are things that are out of bounds for the money that you all have to pay in taxes. And here are things that we kind of give our stamp of approval. So we may not like a lot of things people teach and we should condemn them and say they're wrong and say you know why they're wrong, but I wouldn't make it illegal. So same for, same for a Proud Boys school or uh, uh, you know an American Ku Klux Klan school? Yeah, I would say that what we need is a system in which we, we don't rely on government to say we can't do that. 
it has to be something where we condemn it. In fact, there's some research that shows that when we try and have government treat people unequally, they become sort of more militant. They become more resentful. That doesn't mean we approve any of it. But what we say is government doesn't get to decide whose values are right. And I think that you might even be able to see the rise of Trump as an example of many people are saying, I'm tired of government telling me what is right and what is wrong. There's certainly a lot more going on there. And we've actually looked at the records of people arrested in January 6th for whom we could find high school education data. And that was certainly not everyone. So this is not scientific, but they were slightly disproportionately went to public school, probably not statistically significant. But the point is we don't have any evidence that allowing freedoms leads to more militancy. And I think we have some that it doesn't. It doesn't mean we think any of that is okay. We should condemn it completely, but we can't have government uh, take decide what is or is not orthodoxy, what is okay to think or not think, but, but, and but then Neil, can take we, can, our can money we, and apply it to those. Neil, can we have government um, instead can we have government trying to prevent what you're calling orthodoxy? That is, can we have government schools that say, because we're a government school, um, yes, we're going to have a curriculum because all schools have curricula, including private ones. But because we believe in liberty, what we're going to do is we're going to teach people how to challenge that curriculum and how to challenge each other. Um, that seems to me just a fundamental practice of citizenship in a democracy is the ability to do that. And it seems to me if we allow people to make a Proud Boys or an American Nazi Party school, what we're saying is that we're going to allow children in this country to grow up in an environment where they're not exposed to that, to that thing where they're propagandized in a way that's going to prevent them from developing those civic skills. I don't know how we can allow that. Well, but so the answer to that is we're not seeing that. And again, historically, it's in your book, I think, in many cases, we haven't seen that sort of, you know, exposure to multiple ideas and critical thinking and critical debate in the public schools. Often what we'd seen historically were public schools reinforcing bad things, including segregation. I, uh, uh, it always kind of concerns me. We condemn choice of things we don't like and say public schooling is better, but public schooling actually forced on people many of the things we don't like. And I don't think we typically see that kind of idea, which I think would be what I'd want for my kids' history class, where we say, now deal with these different ideas, how to approach things, and really debate them and look at them critically. And even if you could do that, you can. I don't know that happens very often, but the other question is, do people trust the schools to actually be doing that? Right. So I would not say that, I would say we put liberty above these concerns of kind of like social safety, in part because the public schools haven't done a good job historically of keeping us safe from those bad things. They've often reinforced those bad things. Mm -hmm. And to take the most obvious example, Moms for Liberty does not trust the public schools, right? You were right about that for sure, right? Um, but Neil, I would say they believe in the public schools. That's why they're attacking them. And that's the only thing well, I like about Moms for Liberty. I don't want to take away too much time from the Q&A that's probably come in because uh, I was going to mention this is there is actually a debate. This is more informational than my uh, viewpoint, but there's a debate among conservatives now of. Do you put most of your political eggs in the school choice basket or do you put it in the control public schools basket? I don't know that that's because they from the ones I've spoken with, it's because they value public schooling as an institution. I think it's, well, we're not going to get choice widely, so we have to control these things. But that is also why I'm worried. I don't want a system where it's like, okay, if we can get enough power, this is now ours. There was just a story about the Keller Independent School District in uh, Texas, um, where they have removed books. They just said they will only allow Christians to pray 
at the beginning of school board meetings because everybody on the school board is Christian. That should be very concerning. I want the people in that district who are not Christian or don't like what's happening there to have the ability to take their tax dollars or the money to educate their kids somewhere else where they're not forced into that. Okay, we'll move back to questions. And we've got one from Bob. He says, great exchange, a question from my friend, John. According to the contact hypothesis work, successful integration depends on having fairly similar skill levels and common overriding identities, Catholicism or whatever. Aren't those way easier to get in schools of choice? They may be, and I assume this is Bob Moranto, I think is one of the more eloquent defenders of, of uh, choice. I used to call him Dr. Choice or Professor Choice. And look, you know, just to be clear, I am not here to make a brief against choice. And to go back to the district in Texas that Neil is talking about, um, I would support the right of anybody in that district or any district for that matter to set up their own school. You know, um, uh, I think the, the, the harder question, though, is do we want to promote that as a solvent for the disagreements we're talking about? And to me, that's a different question. Should they have the right to do that? Yes. Should we public dollars? That's a little bit more complicated, but I'm open to the idea. Um, but I think what worries me, and I think this is where I disagree with Bob and Neil, what worries me is the idea of making, uh, imagining choice as, as the solvent for these sorts of debates uh, and these sorts of disputes. You know, um, uh, I don't think it ever has been. I don't think it will be. And, you know, I keep saying to journalists that call me about Moms for Liberty, like the answer is for people that don't like Moms for Liberty to create Moms for Freedom, uh, which, by the way, some people have. Um, uh, it's not to, you know, I, um, I exempt yourself from the system. I, I you know, I... <laughs> There are a lot of reasons that Glenn Youngkin is the governor of Neil McCluskey's state, uh, um, but here's the biggest one. Terry McAuliffe, in an unforced error, said that he thought that parents should just butt out of these disputes. Uh, just to be clear, I don't believe that's the only reason he lost. I think Youngkin ran a better campaign, but I think it's the major one, and I think history will confirm that. Um, why was that an error? Because in America, you don't butt out. You butt in. You butt in. Um, uh, and I think that Virginia and every state will be a lot better when there are other organizations like Moms for Freedom challenging Moms for Liberty and creating precisely, I think, the kind of battle that Neil McCluskey doesn't want. I believe in that battle. Yeah, I, I have no problem with people having lots of very spirited debates about what kids should learn, what's right, what's wrong. What I want to remove is the stakes of when you lose, I mean, you really lose. You are forced to pay for that school and it's not going to teach what you think is right. Maybe what you think is morally correct. It may teach things you think are immoral. And I don't think we have a free society if that is how we educate kids. Is It's always a zero-sum conflict to see who gets to control the money everybody has to pay. I don't, I don't think that that's how it often works in practice. I mean, it's also worth noting, actually, I should say this, I should always say this when I talk about conflicts. We, we read a lot about these conflicts and these conflicts are bad and these conflicts are real, but I don't actually think that they are taking part or, or taking place with certainly the ferocity we see on a national level in many schools and most school districts. I think most people go to school, their kids get the, the history, the math, the reading, whatever it is they want, and they move on. I don't think everybody's at each other's throats, but we see a lot of it. We certainly see it at the national level. Um, and I, I, as fundamentally as a matter of liberty, that, that bothers me, but I also think we can engage in these questions more productively when we don't have zero sum winner loser stakes, which tend to lead, like politics often does, to the most extreme demonization because you feel I have to do whatever it takes to win. And I think that Bob, and you're probably right, it's Bob Morento, but if not, we both lose points because it turns out it's somebody else named Bob. But I think the contact thesis, and I, I write about this in the book, is very important. That says basically you want people not to feel like they're competitors and you want to give them something that, that puts them on equal basis 
and like they're cooperating and they're part of a team, not that they're competing for something. I think a, a, a program like busing made people feel like they're in competition. Something like a magnet school says, no, you're going there for something that you want. Something like a religious school can say, not only are you going for something you want, it's values you share, and you may even be, you know, we're all trying to get each other to heaven or whatever it is that that school is about. So I think that we really need to think more in depth just generally about how is it we have sustainable positive contact among diverse people. And I'm not sure that we've always done that in public schooling. Uh, well, you're right about that. Right. I mean, you know, again, I look upon public schools the same way that Winston Churchill did about democracy. You know, it's like the worst thing imaginable except for the other things. You know, um, I'm not going to try to defend everything that happens in public schools. That is impossible. They are radically imperfect for many of the reasons you've said and many others, too. But, Neil, I would like to challenge this idea of zero sum, you know, and this idea that, you know, if the state recommends a certain curriculum, it's taking away your liberty. The only thing that takes away your liberty is if you're not allowed to criticize that curriculum. And the devil is hugely in the details here, right? So, you know, um, if the school adopts the, uh, you know, uh, the sort of traditional history and you're really into the 1619 project, I don't think the adoption of the traditional history is a kind of, I don't think it's a zero sum game here where you've been deprived of your liberty. The only thing that would deprive you of your liberty is if teacher or school said, no, we cannot mention the 1619 project and we cannot discuss the 1619 project because it contradicts the state textbook. Well, it does contradict the state, the state textbook, that's true. And insofar as that occurs, that's called indoctrination and you can't have it. But it strikes me as entirely legitimate for the school to adopt that curriculum, whatever it might be, the standard history, the traditional history, provided, and this is where the devil is in the details, is in the details, that you create a culture where this stuff is open to challenge and open to critique. Well, so you can actually go to, to states where they've talked about it we will prohibit the teaching of 1619 in the public schools. So there are, if that is the definition of losing liberty, then that's actually happening. But you can understand because if the idea is democratic control, if the majority says we, we forbid this in the school, well, as long as the majority says it, then that's a as a matter of democracy, that's an acceptable outcome. I don't think that that should be an acceptable outcome in education. And so we do see that. And there's sort of maybe grades of dep deprivation of liberty. So you may say, okay, well, this school that you must pay for, you don't have a choice but to pay your taxes. You know, we're going to teach uh, creationism, but feel free to say you don't like creationism. You are certainly, as that person, being treated less equally than the person who does like creationism. The schools are doing what they want. If you want something else, you have to say, well, you know, I don't really like this. And now I have to go out and I got to do all sorts of outside research so I can say why I don't like it. And oh, by the way, why aren't you letting me talk? But we have to continue with this lesson. So we're not going to keep debating it because we have to move on to the next thing. That is at the very least inequality, it seems to me, legal inequality, even if it's not a total deprivation of liberty. I, I, it, it bothers me as a, you know, as a matter of principle and because we see states that are doing things like saying, nope, no 1619 for you. Oh, you're muted. Uh, hey, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Neil, we agree 100% on that. Um, I think those laws are anathema, uh, precisely because they prevent this the kind of discussion that I think both you and I want. Um, uh, but they don't strike me as an argument against the system. They strike me as a mistaken set of activities within that system that the system allows for challenge to. Again, if you don't like those laws, fight those laws. Um, you know, those laws were passed by legislators that I think made an enormous mistake. Um, and I think part of democracy is precisely that or challenging the laws that you don't like and correcting them. Extreme uh, gloss on this. And this is not the argument you're making, but we wouldn't have said that about 
eventually said that about racially segregated schools. We don't say, that's fine. If you don't like it, make sure you change the laws. We said that that is not something government should be able to do. And I don't think we'd ever want to subject that to democratic control. I just sort of extend that to all sorts of things saying, we, it's not sufficient to say, well, you can vote the people out who've done this. I would like to see a system where fundamentally it protects liberty, not say you get the liberty because you can say something about it maybe. And then if you can get enough political support, you can change the system to what you want. You know, I look, I, I, I take your point. And um, obviously the whole reason we have courts is uh, we don't have a purely majoritarian system. And, uh, you know, people have made laws that have been unconstitutional and been struck down for that reason. And that's a good thing. Right. But I think the most important thing, frankly, is what happens within schools and within classrooms. You know, I think eventually this moment, this crazy moment we're in is going to pass. I really do. Um, uh, and then it will just be us again, like we teachers and we students, uh, we scholars. It's just going to be the schools. And the question, the most important question is going to be what's going to happen inside of them. To me, that's always the most important question. And Neil, I would contest the idea that in the scenario you just described, there's something unequal about the kid or the family that has to challenge the majoritarian viewpoint. I think that there's a lot of evidence that that sort of dynamic and that sort of challenge is highly educational and highly democratic with a small d. I think that's what this book by Robbie and Sonia about Howard Zinn is really about. Um, you know, I think it's about students and occasionally some supportive teachers who were challenging the conventional wisdom in their schools and through that process, learning something hugely important about what citizenship and democracy are. That's what I want to see. Yeah, well, well it looks like you know, Jonathan got the I, last word, Neil. <laughs> we, we are up at time, but I, hopefully that makes it better that, you know, since he had, he was against, not against, but there are two Cato people with him, so. Totally fair, totally fair. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you to everybody who joined the event. We had a lot of questions come in that we weren't able to get to all of them. And a video recording will be available on Cato's website shortly. So if you missed any of it, feel free to check back with us and, um, you know, catch up on what you missed. Thank you very much.